Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 24 of The Last Admiral. It's Saturday, the 19th of February, 2022. Um, this next section of the book <clears throat> is going to be really tough for me to get through. As the rangers who I depict, um, most of them are based on real people, real rangers who I knew in 3rd Ranger Battalion uh, during the time of the Battle of Mogadishu. And uh, their leader, Sir John Anderson, uh, is my great uncle uh, who fought in World War II and the invasion of Sicily in northern Sicily. <clears throat> and the depiction of uh, Sir John's fall, his death, if you will, um, or his wounding, uh, very well parallels the story he told me of the wounds he incurred in Sicily. So uh, it's going to be tough for me to get through. Let's give it a shot. <clears throat> So a little bit back from where we ended off, Sir John is facing several drow footmen who are fast approaching him. Uh, surrender rangers, their leader said, in bad firmish, or die. Sir John faced them bravely, remembering his months in home, with its soft wooded hills, babbling brooks filled with trout, green fields, fat cows, and holiday dinners. He smiled back at them. Surrender was not in his family's blood. But neither did he crave death, for life was sacred to him despite his duty. The drow footmen were fast, driven as they were by a fell enchantment that doubled their speed. But they were soldiers with weapons of melee, and as such, they were unable to strike at them without moving in. Their superior numbers and extreme zeal made them overconfident, foolish, and sloppy. Sir John and his squire killed three of them before they realized their mistake. Forced to back off, the drow leader hurled a small round jar made of clay near Sir John's feet. Squire David did not see it. Get back, Sir John cried as he retreated from it, knowing that Dragonian troops sometimes filled such devices with deadly scorpions or other devilish devices, all of which he held in contempt. It exploded, and the blast knocked them down with many grievous wounds. Rising up, a hail of arrows rained upon them, piercing both of Sir John's lungs and each of his knees. Somehow he remained standing, but Squire David lay still and unmoving on the ground. Believing Sir John to be helpless, the nearby drow moved in to finish him. John's sword and dirk were gone, but his ranger's dagger remained in its sheath at his waist. Drawing it in utter agony, he hurled it into the drow's exposed throat. The marine staggered for a moment in shock, and then fell dying to the ground. Gasping for breath, Sir John's mouth quickly filled with his life's blood. His strength left him like a breeze through an open door. Collapsing onto his back, he used his hands to try to stop the blood that poured out of him like a river. He noticed a few fluttering clouds dancing in the blue sky above him. Vision fading, a Dragonian soldier stepped into his view, looking down at him. Clothed as a marine in armor of black, he was a detestable drow with haunting green eyes and a hawkish nose. Surely he was hallucinating, because he heard the soldier's voice but the man's lips never moved. You fought well, Sir John. When you feel the bite of my blade, you must feign death. It is your only chance. Beside him walked the terrible Jin Jang Lo. Remember, Sergeant, when we meet the enemy, we kill him. We show him no mercy. Yes, General, the Sergeant replied. And the, uh, the footnote is from World War II, The Definitive Visual History. Uh, when we meet the enemy, we kill him. We show him no mercy, is a quote from General George S. Patton from World War II. <clears throat> Ice-cold steel pierced Sir John's chest, cutting along his ribs and through the muscles of his back. Detached as he was, past the pain, and his mind merely... I'm sorry, detached, he was past the pain, and his mind merely lingered on it like some curiosity. Gurgling blood and in shock, he knew no more. 
Jin Jang Lo and his army marched on, ignoring the dead. There were still 106 rangers left to kill. The Silver Go. <clears throat> Enemy ships approaching from the west, Captain. Ensign Waters called down from the crow's nest. I count at least 15 vessels. Wait, sir. Enemy troops are approaching along the beach, and from the south as well, thousands of them. Oi, anchor, O'Brien commanded. Cast off all ropes and prepare to sail. I, Captain, his first mate replied. Avast, O'Brien cried. I see them. They are coming in. A hundred at least from the hills and a few from the beach. Pull in every rope except for the two next to the gangplank. Aye, Captain, the first mate said. Archers to the rail, O'Brien commanded. Protect those troops and defend the ship. Looking out through his spyglass, the rangers to the south would ride in first and then those on the west beach, but it was going to be dangerously close. Come on, he called to them. Like some terrible game, the rangers somehow kept ahead of both the sailing ships and the marching horde, until one by one the exhausted warriors began coming on deck. Sibylline, the golden-haired elf, was there, as were the courageous rangers Pilla, the tall northern barbarian flying eagle, and the goodly Aaron knight Sir Tad Moore. Nearly seventy more rangers had come aboard when the Dragonian troops lying in wait within the quaint homes of Sina sprung their trap. Several squads of enemy marines had slipped into the village under cover of darkness, waiting for this very moment to strike. All hands to stations, O'Brien commanded. Prepare to haul the gangplank in and cast off on my order. He was a stocky man of average height, with wavy brown hair of brown and eyes of Aaron blue. His back was broad and his hands were wide. In years he was a man of forty-eight summers, but a life at sea had kept him reasonably fit. And somehow he had time to write this book. Sir Andrew was among those already aboard. There are still rangers out there, Captain. On land, the pier was now alive with fighting. Dragonian marines were flooding in from the village streets, and Sergeant Ruiz, the bravest of rangers, had dismounted, taking a stand in order to defend the ship. If we don't leave now, O'Brien said, torn between the urge to stand and fight a hopeless battle, and duty's call to save as many lives as he could, none of us will get off of this island alive. Sir Andrew well understood his plight. Archers, drive those damned drow back from whence they came. Rangers and sailors with bows soon joined him by the gunwall, sending what shafts they had into the advancing foe. Fall back, Sir Andrew called to them. Fall back to the ship. It was then, when the cost of failure had reached its zenith, that many of Sir John's rangers' company, who were already aboard, disembarked amid the chaos, intent as they were on fighting beside their friends, with cries to battle, rattling swords and silver shields. They returned with valor to fight beside their comrades. O'Brien watched in horror as the rangers engaged the vastly superior force of the enemy. Their fearsome captain wore armor of black plate mail, and he was huge in comparison to his companion Drow. Its cold, emotionless visor concealed his face, whether human, orc, or ogre. What lay beneath it was a mystery. He wielded a massive sword with a six-foot blade and commanded his force from the front with a baritone voice of authority. His orders were intelligent, ruthless, and obeyed, but O'Brien sensed that somehow he took no pleasure in his actions. The drow's main force of thousands was only minutes away. O'Brien's heart tore itself apart. Join them, it cried out. To die with honor could be no greater pain than this. Dark-haired Ruiz fought like a berserk, heroically, valiantly, like the shining sun. He had heard the call of the blade, 
The hero's light was upon him, and his ranger's creed was a part of his very soul. <clears throat> His rangers, his beloved, he did not want them all to die, not here, not for a nothing battle that they could not win. Go on, he screamed, get the hell out of here. Mad with battle lust and beyond his own pain, he killed all who came near him, and for a moment he turned the tide, winning the pier and holding the gate. His fellow rangers loved and respected him, and most obeyed his now dying wishes and rushed back to the ship. Eighteen rangers, both men and women, humans and elves, refused to leave him, and these continued to do battle beside him. O'Brien realized their sacrifice and their decisions made. Take in the gangway, cast off, and make for the open sea. Bountiful tears were in his eyes as he gave the order, but every ranger on land and on board knew that he had no choice. Enemy marines made daring leaps from the pier and onto the rigging, off the starboard beam, and soon there was desperate fighting on deck. A skillful sergeant, who quickly organized his force and fought toward the quarter-deck, led them, but his squad was small, and the ship had drifted too far out for more of his soldiers to reinforce them. Fighting on, they asked for no quarter and received none. Familiar with great ships, the sergeant understood their position and sought to sabotage them, by destroying the ship's wheel and helm mechanism. Sir Andrew intervened, and a great struggle began on the stairs leading up to the quarter-deck. Standing portside on the third and fourth steps, noble Andrew defended the ship with his long sword, his armored body, and bold courage. Sibylline and a trio of rangers held the starboard stair, and a vicious fight ensued. Rangers and knights who were fighting nearby rushed to their aid and quickly defeated the saboteurs. The drow leader was the last to fall, and the most skillful fighter among them, wounding many rangers. Sir Andrew finally brought him down with a thunderous pommel stroke that laid him low. Seize him, Sir Andrew commanded. Remove his armor and search him for hidden arms. He may have information that may be of some use to us. I'm not sure if he's going to make it, Sir Sibylline reported. His skull is cracked. Take him below to the surgeon. If he lives... Then we'll question him. Right away, sir, she replied. Get these wounded below, Sir Andrew directed, and check for survivors. The ship was now a hundred yards from the docks. Occasionally, arrows landed on deck or struck some part of the ship, but the breeze was stiff and archery was no longer effective. They are all dead, sir, Ranger Pia said. Did we lose anyone? A few rangers are badly hurt, he reported, but they'll live. Take a few soldiers and search below decks. I want to make sure that none of them were able to slip past us. I'm on it, sir. Sir Andrew turned his attention then to the struggle on the pier, where eighteen rangers still battled. They were exhausted and without hope, having fought, climbed, and run for weeks with little food and water. The odds were against them, as they always were, and yet the forces of Jin Jang Lo suffered in their submission. Sir Percival and Ranger Jissick were beside Ruiz at the end, and when there was nowhere left to move, to fight, or to run. In a last-ditch effort, they fought to reach the sea, and in that manner, at least, to rob their enemy of victory. But the odds were too great. Most died fighting, but wounds incapacitated some of them, allowing their capture, and of these, there were eight rangers, all told. Tie them to the moorings, both hands and feet, Jin Jang Lo commanded, and then his troops handled the captive rangers unmercifully. Bound helplessly like animals to the pier, they faced the sea and the vision of the silver gull sailing away for home. You fought well, Jin Jang Lo said to them. You succeeded in allowing that young upstart, self-righteous Prince Ivan, to escape. Oh, sorry. That is of no consequence, as I will soon have the honor of destroying him and his pitiful little settlement. What do you call it? He asked while pacing the docks behind their line. Oh yes, safe haven. Continuing his methodical walk with his arms crossed behind his back, he predicted, A few years from now it will lie in ruins, reduced to ashes beneath my feet, and I will destroy everything that you hold dear. 
What is it that you rangers say? Oh, yes, never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. They should have stood and fought beside you like warriors of honor. What a pity. Standing on the end of the pier, he watched the silver gull slip through the closing fingers of his trap with a look that combined frustration, anger, and amusement. On some other shore, in another land, or at a different time, the natural beauty of the day may have struck even him. Brilliant sunshine, dancing along the surface of the sea, a stiff, cooling breeze off the water and pearl-white Sicilian beaches were all around him. But his mood was far too foul to appreciate any of it. It was a partial victory, yes, but any half-victory was a complete failure in his eyes, and his ire had risen. His troops stood behind him. Dead bodies, blood, and discarded wares littered the wharf. His hands grasped the handles of his swords. Both of them were family heirlooms, passed on from fathers to sons for the last nine generations. They were masterworks of folded mithril alloy, single-edged, and gently curved to their tips. One sword was in length three and one-half feet, and its sister fully a foot shorter. The handguards were ornate, dipped in gold, and in the form of a lion and a tiger, curled head to tail in a perfect circle. Their cast gold pommels and eelskin wrapped handles could accommodate two hands. The scabbards alone were priceless works of red silver, inlaid with gems and inscribed with the names of his ancestors. His slender fingers strummed the sword's grips impatiently, reflecting the turmoil of his thoughts. <clears throat> his battle dress was the result of the fine craftsmanship of his own hands. Sewn and formed from red dragon's hide, it protected him from head to toe, and the terrifying image of Tiamat rose in detailed relief across the front and back of his cuirass. His well-heeled boots elevated him to a full five feet five inches in height. Born in Farad Hoth, he was the first-born son of a renowned weaponsmith, conscripted into military service upon his coming of age, as was the Dark Elvar custom. He had brilliant green eyes, skin the color of dark smoke, his hair a fair silver sheen that he wore in a single tight top knot. His jawline and face were square-shaped, as were his hands, both of which were lean and defined in appearance. His teeth were white and well-formed, his mouth reflecting his hard manner. Three bold scars marred his left cheek, jaw, and neck, the result of a struggle at sea against a deadly kraken. His loyal followers believed him to be invincible because of his victory that day. As he turned to face his wounded prisoners, his intent was ill. My family has always held retreat to be one of the highest forms of dishonor. Indeed, in order to save face, such a one would most certainly commit suicide in order to prevent their mark of cowardice from tainting their family name forever. Casually walking over the bodies of the dead, he stood before the nearest ranger and studied him with apparent pity. Injured nearly unto death and barely conscious, he clearly had only a few moments left to live. I respect the sacrifice that you made here this day, and it saddens me that you have failed to die fighting as I would have, but I can help you to preserve your honor. Releasing his longsword from the compressive grip of its scabbard with his thumb, he drew it out effortlessly with his right hand. This is the sacred sword of my family, forged by my ancestors of a secret metal alloy. It is an absolute masterwork, immune to the destructive light of the sun, impervious to water, salt, and resilient enough to withstand adamant. We have passed it down from father to son for over a thousand years. Its name is Immortal Spirit. The runes on the hilt and scabbard tell the story of my family and our code. No jinn has ever surrendered, none has ever retreated, and none ever shall. To fall beneath the cut of this sword is a great honor, for you and your comrades alone. Fought like members of the House of Jinn. In death, may you find the honor that you failed to find here. Methodically, he then decapitated them all one by one cut their bindings, 
and kicked their corpses into the sea. When he was finished, he seemed quite pleased with his work. Sergeant, he commanded, call for my breakfast. Killing is hungry work. Yes, my general, he replied. Captain O'Brien watched the scene in horror from the portside quarterdeck and through the magnifying lenses of his spyglass. He saw it all. The rangers' bodies floated aimlessly, aimlessly about for a time, drifting about the wooden pilings until they finally sank beneath the ocean's waves. Their blood was on his hands. Had he done the right thing in saving those that he could, or should they all have stayed and died? He cried openly as he walked the deck, and Sir John's rangers cried with him. They knew the ultimate price that soldiers often paid. Let your heart be free, Sir Andrew said consolingly. I know the pain that you now hold, guilt deep inside, that calls for one warrior to fall beside his brother. How can I know if I did the right thing, or if I doomed those rangers to hell? We are rangers all, and we live by our creed, Sir Andrew replied, as he stood beside him. The creed is our law, a guideline written by warriors, as a promise to each other. <clears throat> but the creed is not the highest law. Today, the strength of rangers failed, and our laws were broken, but they were fractured for a reason. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And of course, that's from Ephesians in the New Testament, 6.12. No mortal can know if one God is truly the God and the highest, but goodness, truth, and love can never be denied. Ruiz, Sir Percival, and his rangers did not die in vain, for they died fighting for the laws in the highest. If some day I am still alive when this war is over, I will come back for them, or whatever remains. I swear it. To the west, some of the Dragonian vessels took to the chase. But the Silver Gull was a fast ship made by the greatest elven shipwrights, and by nightfall they had escaped. O'Brien steered them truly and cared for them well. They would soon reach the shores of their beloved Ferminor. Their sacrifices would not be in vain. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed this segment it was a tough reading for me, but I hope you enjoyed the action. Until next time, have a great night.